Now, I'm recording this at midnight, well, nearly midnight, on the 5th of April. And this is not the first version of this I've recorded. In fact, it's probably about the 6th. And I'm recording it because the 5th, which was my preferred version, for some reason has got sound issues. So, I'm hoping this will be as good as the 5th. I apologise if it's closer to the 3rd edition. And I'm hoping it's not as bad as the 2nd one, because the 2nd one I just kept giggling. The Battle of Valapriso. Now, this is one of the battles of the War of 1812. And... I want to tell you this before I begin. There are some frigate jewels in the War of 1812 which are mastery. They are pure skill on both parts. The officers do nothing and crew do nothing but bestow their nations with honour and glory and greatness. It doesn't matter the result. Both sides acquit themselves wonderfully. There are battles where truly America shows the potential of its navy to in the future, the potential the officer corps it has that to grow. There are battles where they also show their newness to the global naval stage and their ability to support and project themselves and its weaknesses vis-a-vis -vis a nation which is an expand ex existent global empire. Then there is the Battle of Valapriso. This is the first battle where we have enough information about both sides that we conclusively say the British are doing a tactic which will be mo made most famous by what happens with the events of the Battle of the River Plate. But honestly, will be used a lot over the years. I mean, it is a pretty much a favoured tactic of the Royal Navy. And getting away with a tactic once is, well, that's, that's wonderful. Twice, getting problematic. Pulling it off multiple times, so often against the same nations, for a period of roughly 150, 160 years. In various guises, in both peacetime exercises and wartime, actual war scenarios, that becomes a meme. That is a running joke. There is a small problem with this battle. The Ameri uh, On the side of it is David Porter, who honestly makes David Beatty look shy and retiring in some of his shameless self-promotion. And I kid you not, that is me being kind. He is an ardent political admiral. He is an excellent political ad admiral. That is what he becomes. But he is also a strategic and tactical liability. He almost starts a war with Spain. This is after the War of 1812. And that's why he ends up going becoming the head of the Mexican Navy, because the Americans kick him out. Um... In this scenario, to say he is out fought, as in T O T H O U G H T, rather than an F O U G H T, is an understatement. James Hillier has him so outfoxed and has him on so many levels, it's not a fair fight, it's not even a fight. When the battle actually takes place, Porter has managed to absolutely destroy any support and goodwill he has from local authorities in Valparaiso. Any of them. In fact, local Chilean authorities, frankly, uh, by that point, the local governor despises the very wood of the deck of the ship he walks upon because of his actions and what he's done in his harbour and because of how he's tried to lie straight to his face after doing things in front of his own eyes and then come back and go, well, they did this. No, they didn't. I was watching you. 
there is it, look there is a level of stupidity when you believe that you are so good at lying and i know there are many politicians in this world who do follow the policy that they are believe they're good enough to do this that even when you've done something in front of other people watching you you then turn around and tell those people you didn't do it that way they just literally see you do it This is Porter. But as said, he is in many ways dancing to the tune set by Hillier. And when I say dancing to the tune, I mean he is absolutely dancing to the tune. Hillier wanted a battle in a certain way at a certain time. He didn't want to fight to have... He had reinforcements coming up. He made sure Porter knew this, so Porter came out early. Why? Because if Porter was still there when the reinforcements arrive, he might never come out, and that's going to tie up the Royal Navy frigates for ages. That's going to tie them up for us to war, and they're not going to be able to do all the other things they need to do. So far better to get Porter to bring out the Essex and the Essex Junior. I mean, come on, man. Have some pride when you name your prizes. Calling it the Essex Junior? I know he ends up calling... Yeah, I know what he ends up calling his son. I, I do know that, and I do know what Farragut changes his name to in order to be like him and all these things. I, I do know that. But still, Essex Junior? Sounds like an under ten foot uh, under ten football team, and I'll say that. But but in the UK, you know what I mean, and in the US, you you can just go with whatever you take that to be. It doesn't sound like a ship, not a warship. Think about that: the USS Essex Junior. And by the way, before we get there, I'm going to let a little bit of a little bit of the, uh, the cat out of the bag. The British consider that ship to be so capable, they don't fire on it in the entire fight. No matter what it does, they just ignore it. They look at it, see this little baby ship, they know it, what it's exactly it's armed with, they just ignore it and forget it's there. They don't bother about it one jot. They just keep blasting away at the Essex and don't take any notice of the Essex Junior. It it might as well not be there. It might it's just sitting there going, you, I'm I'm firing. You're taking it. It is. Whenever you see a fight between two sort of big guys, or usually it's usually it's big guys, but sometimes it's you know, girls on in a movie. There's usually a smaller sidekick friend who is no one really cares about, who's running around the side going, yeah, yeah, get them. That no one bothers to take a swing at because honestly, it'd be embarrassing for them to hit that. It would just, it would just make them feel bad to hit it because it just, it's, it's the definition of punching down. It's the definition of punching down in any scenario. Well, that is the Essex Junior. It's going to, go on, go on, you can get them. Well, there are two quite large British frigates bashing away against the Essex going, if we just pretend it's not there it's not there it's not like it's close enough to actually hurt us, we can just ignore it, okay? we can just ignore it it doesn't make us feel as bad if we don't actually hit it or don't actually aim. And it ends up surrendering at the end of the fight anyway. They don't need to take it out. Because it knows if the Essex gets sunk they or captured, they have no chance. Again, like that annoying yappy friend running around in a movie fight. That's fun. So... Thank you to everyone who does support the channel and who like. If you like the video, please do like, share, and subscribe. They're down here, and um, 
maybe if you want to support my ever-growing book habit, there are books up there. Uh, there's, I mean, there's Patreon, there's Ko-fi, and there's being a member of the channel. That's always very helpful because that allows to keep the channel going. And the channel really does... I think it's like 80% of the money which comes in to support the channel comes in through Patreon and memberships. Ad revenue really doesn't generate a lot. And as I've said in other scenarios, but there seems to be some real misunderstandings about royalties from book don't, uh, books don't generate a lot. Um, the, the royalties from my second edition of my book, which is out and you can get, came in. And the royalties I received for selling quite a lot of copies, I felt, was £174. It worked out at about a few pence a book. Which is nothing to sniff at. But I still do see people on Twitter going, Oh, historians should do all this stuff for free, or should be able to do this for free, because they've got books out. No. No. Um, I don't know who makes money off books. I do know the academic and historical book publishing industry is apparently a multi-billion pound industry across the world, and especially in the English-speaking world, they seem to make a lot of money on it. But I do know that the authors do not get a lot of money up from it. I do know we have to pay a huge amount of money to get the rights to publish pictures in the books. But we do not get a lot of money from it. Or basically any money. However, academics have to do books and have to actually... can't They can't even include self-published books, although I'm going to be doing some self-published books this year to get promoted in universities. To get hired in universities as a lecturer, etc., you need to be published. You need to be, it's publish or perish. So you have to do this in order to get an academic job. And let's be honest, there are less and less of those around as well. Which could lead to a whole crisis of thought, but at the moment I'm dealing with the joy that is David Porter and his crisis of leadership, or rather, his ego writing checks he just can't cash. Now, the War of 1812 up until 1814 is not going necessarily badly for the US. Okay, they'd started the war, they have various ideas and various things come into the war as their reasons for war, but let's be honest, it was basically, uh, the strategic analysis went, Napoleon's going to keep the British busy, the British are going to be therefore busy in Europe, so we can get Canada. We can unify North America. Um, let's be honest, they forgot that there's a small problem with that. A, the Canadians didn't want to be liberated by the Americans. B, Canada had mostly been settled by, well, the two largest sections of the population this were people who'd left America after the... Uh, uh, American War of Independence, because they didn't want to be in an independent America, and the Quebecois, who don't like anyone. Okay, they really don't like anyone. I will emphasize again, they do not em like anyone. And then there's, of course, there's the, the full native population as well. And they also weren't that keen on the expansion of the Americans. So, those whole things are interesting. Now, I have done videos about the, where I've looked into the cause of the American the War of 1812, and basically both sides are equally pushing, doing tit for tat. Neither side is acquitting itself with great glory or honour at the tra at causing this war. Both are basically trying to sour each other's milk. And trying to get away with it, and thinking they're going to get away with it. They all—they think they can all. They both sides think they can push the F one a bit further, and then, well, there's the declaration of war, and the Americans think, because the British forces are mostly focused in Europe, dealing with the French threat, they won't be able to shift over. Of course, as the war goes on, the Americans end up finding themselves with well over a hundred British frigates patrolling various parts of their coast. Plus third rate, uh, third rate, uh, quite a few number of third rates, and uh, a few larger vessels as well turning up, and that 
basically is the problem. That is the problem for the Americans. They have invested in a navy which was incredibly well suited for them in many ways. They were trying to build some ships online, but they'd mostly concentrated on these rather large frigates, which were beautiful ships, but they're frigates. And whilst these are very large, powerful, heavy frigates that can take on any other nation's frigates and probably have a good chance of success, they can't take on a ship at a line. There is often discussion about whether the Constitution could have beaten the victory in a fight. I'm sorry to anyone who ever puts forward the idea the Constitution could. Because the sheer weight of fire pad the victory has is what's going to decide the fight. The sheer weight and density of fire pad. Added to that, there's the height advantage. She can literally fire down into you. She can clear your decks. If she can clear her, your decks with her guns, then she can board your ship and take control of your ship. Because you have to remember, all the stuff which, you know, helps propel you, all the engine, is, um, of a sailing ship, is above the deck. And that's basically the problem for many of these plans and many of the plans they have at this time period. Because once you have enough third rate starts to show up, the US frigates can't put the sea. They're looking out and going, we want to get the sea. But if we get caught in a fight with that, we have no chance. That is a full on warship. That is a fleet ship. We can fight pretty much any frigate one on one and stand a pretty good chance of winning. There are some Razés out there. We really don't want to get involved in a fight with any of the British Razés because they are equivalents, but they are made of ship of the line timbers and thickness timbers rather than frigate thickness timbers. And whilst we have thick, frigate t uh, uh, thick timbers for a frigate, they are, they're sort of beginning level for ship of the line. And most of the ship of the line in terms of the Royal Navy Service and the French Navy Service, which are have been fighting each other a lot for the previous, you know, 50-odd years at this point, um, we're only in what's often referred to as the Second Hundred Years' War period. They're, they're, they're kind of well-built. Uh, they're, they're kind of very well-built. Um... The British were kind of proficient at shipbuilding, and let's be honest, they're so proficient that they'd already marked up before the War of Independence the various trees in the American forests they wanted, and the US Navy, when they were looking for wood, just went around hunting for the trees which had all been marked by the British with their symbols. Because it was there, and it was, good, it was a good idea, and that was already, uh, already highlighted good quality wood. And if anyone wants to argue against that, I'd also point that out it's quite financially sensible. And they were tend to, did tend to be hiring the same people who were going to be agents and prospectors for the wood as had been originally hired by the British to do that job. Those people were happy to work for good money and happy to take money to find trees which they'd already found. Yes, very so much so. Anyway. This leads us into the war of uh, through the war of eighteen twelve, and at sea, the Americans had had some deserved successes. They really had, and even Porter had had managed to have a success. He had managed early on in with his ship to, well, find HMS Alert, which was a former collier. Uh, that had been converted into a small ship sloop with approximately two nine pounder guns and 16, eight pa 16 18 pounder carronades aboard. So, not exactly the most heavily armed vessel. Inclu this, is, this is even felt by the US Navy after they capture her and turn into USS Alert. 
and they capture her in 1812. She'd been acquired by the Royal Navy in 1804. Originally launched in 1803 as a collier. Um, the US Navy go, um, we're replacing the 9-pounders with 12-pounders. We're replacing the 18-pounder carronades with 18 32-pounder carronades. I'd still not necessarily say that was a useful firepower increase, but it was a firepower increase, and it was acceptable. It, you know, it, it works. Now, she'd actually, as said, been captured by Porter. And he'd also had experience in the Quasi-War with France and had taken action, uh, action in the battle against the Sergeant. And he'd done other duties. He was... Therefore, to an extent, considered an experienced officer. He was certainly a dashing officer who liked to do very brave things. He saw himself as a dashing hero. And that is always the scariest thing. T please take my advice. If ever you, any of one watching this, finds himself in a military, naval, air force unit, and you find yourself with a commanding officer who sees themselves as a dashing hero type, Transfer. Get out of that unit as quickly as you friggin' can. Because that is the type of leader who will literally do anything to get their picture in the papers. And usually they're getting their picture in the papers will get a lot of their people killed. But it will get their picture in the papers. So, yeah. That's great. Now... Before we get too much into today's story, I want to talk about cartel ships because it's a little bit of extra information and it's always good to have a little bit of extra information. Cartel ships are a really interesting thing because it comes from the phraseology prior to treaties, etc. When treaties were sometimes called cartels and that's the some of the origins of that word. Now, usually what this meant was it was a ship was, would be flying special flags to be considered under cartel. And it would carry communications, prisoners, humanitarian aid between the religions. However, for it to work, you had to have an agreement in place. And, well, how do I put this? One of the causes for the War of 1812 is often the sailor issue. And the reason there's the sailor issue and the press issue is that a, the British don't see how you can be born in Britain and then become an American citizen and then not be recruited. That they, they find that absurd. That doesn't work in the British mindset at this time. I understand it doesn't make sense to us and all these things. But the bigger issue, the single biggest issue that you found for British officers when they were trying to, is they're dealing with someone who has this story. So they may have done it, they may not have done it, but they don't have any paperwork as proof. Well, not only did they not have paperwork for this, uh, for that, uh, for that, for citizenship, to so that they could show they were a Brit, which was kind of necessary because at that point the accent hadn't diverged enough. In fact, quite a lot of Americans sounded like they had a very thick Cornish accent to most of the British ears. In fact, if you ever do hear some of the thicker Cornish accents and some of the um, thicker East Coast American accents. And it's it's more such the difference is the tombra is it's sort of the, the, the sort of the level it's at rather than the actual phraseology and syntax is still quite similar. So you can understand where that's coming from. And to an extent. Therefore, they needed paperwork. But the American government so didn't like paperwork, and the British government and the Americans have been quite so playing tit for tat that no one had actually agreed a process of cartel ships between the two nations. So the Admiralty makes an announcement when the war begins that there's going to be no cartel ships. The reason they make the announcement is because there's no agreement between Britain and America over what the policy for cartel ships should be. It's always bureaucracy. If anything ever starts a war between 
countries like Britain and America, who always prefer to have an argu uh, prefer an argument over pretty much anything else, it's always going to be bureaucracy or lack of paperwork. Because that's going to the well, another thing that both nations do share in common, as well as being separated by a common language, is a desire to avoid paperwork. It's strong. The big problem for the Americans in the war, and especially when they were going sailing around the world and trying to do what Porter was doing, which was going off to the uh, going off and to the Pacific and trying to you know cause trouble for the British, is that what some American historians call the British Global Intelligence Network, and I do love it. They call it the Global Intelligence Network. Um, I do see some British historians who want to get popular in certain markets going for the same phraseology. But if you talk to other British historians, uh, including ones like myself, we don't call it the Global Intelligence Network. We call it gossip because the British officers love to gossip. They love to get information. And they love to have social events when they go into port. They will literally be inviting every merchant, every merchant captain who they can grab in port and every local British agent and local, and local merchant and local dignitary. They can get inviting them on board for dinner or accept, and accept having reciprocal dinner inv invitations with them when they return to that port again. You know, They will constantly be building a social network and getting gossip. And they'll constantly be writing to each other about it. An intelligence network would suggest it was a purposeful list of intelligence personnel providing information back. But it's gossip. However, what it does is, is also a command and control network, because those same letters which are going backwards and forwards, if they're from senior officers down, they'll often give objectives. Rarely direct instructions usually be phrased as objectives. Now, this is again another important thing with the British command structure. The British give their officers a fairly large latitude of action. They encourage independent thought. Mainly because the time taken for communications means that you cannot micromanage them. So, you work with phrases called objectives and intentions. A junior officer will send up to a senior officer, these are the intentions of my actions. That's basically code still today in the modern Royal Navy, that if a junior officer says that to the senior officer, the senior officer is only supposed to stop that if they really think it's going to be calamitous. Because basically it's the junior officer going, I know what I'm doing, I know what it's like on the ground, These are this is what I intend to do. This is what I'm going to do. But it's phrased in tensions. And if the senior officer, still to this day again, it's the Royal Navy is quite common with thinking of this, and it's spread out to quite a few NATO navies. Instead of giving orders of, you will do this, 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 they will give orders of, the orders will be structured as, these are your objectives. Please achieve this by this point, this by this point, and this by this point. Good luck. And so they have this level of communication going on. Now, the British had added to this at the beginning of the war end of 1812, and you are now we are now about to talk about the richest naval officers post the War of 1812 of post this, uh, this uh, in part of the Napoleonic War, of any naval officers. The captains who of the frigates which got the silver trade. Oh yes, because you see, if you want to trade with China at this point, you need silver. They only trade in silver. You have to give them silver. And where were they going to get the silver from? Well, they got it from South America, like the Spanish had. And that was half the reason why the South American uh, South American Empire slowly disintegrated because the British wanted access to the silver, so they basically went and had lots of conversations with people, set up lots of trading agreements, and made sure those people, if the Spanish tried to interfere, it were capable of telling the Spanish to go away. We are such a lovely country. We've got so we've got such a wonderfully uh, a wonderful history. No, we. We have done many, many good things. Please do not get me wrong. We have done many good things. We've also done a lot of good things which have been in our own self-interest. The whole theory of enhanced self-interest is basically the history of Britain as an empire. 
That was what we did. We looked at, this is in our interests, so we will support it. The fact it is both good for them and good for us is a beneficial circumstance. In this scenario, the War of 1812 breaks out and the British go, oh! hang on, what happens if they get involved with silver trade? Because let's be honest, Porter, when he goes down the Pacific, is hunting things like whalers. Now, whale oil is important. It's useful. But let's be honest, if the Americans had really wanted to cause a storm, capturing a silver ship, i.e. the modern equivalent of the treasure fleets, well, that would have been big news. That would have been major headlines. That would have been disruption to the eastern trade with China and all the valuable import imports of silks and things which came from China and literally fine bone China, which comes from China at this time, and all sorts of things like that. It would have been truly massive. They never managed to do that. They never managed to do it because of, well, several little incidents which added up to stop it. Uh, pretty much there's the South America station and its Brazil section who are handling the silver trade. They are Royal Navy frigates. And uh, the local station would also provide them with an extra frigate escort until they were far enough out to sea as a rule. And you have to remember, they would have to go and fill their hole, hold up with silver as required by the trade and filling in the merchant trade and talk with all the local merchants and all the, the people about, the, about you know they were buying it from. But anything which could be carried back on the deck As with merchant ships, the same was allowed for the warships. On the grounds they could, they'd have to clear it if they found themselves in action. Luckily, they never did find themselves in action. Well, the captain, and if the captain was sensible, the crew could also bring some stuff back. These ships became very easy to find very good crew for. I mean... They, they were some of the richest ships in the Royal Navy for a few years. If Honestly, if I didn't know better, I'd say the War of 1812 is organised by the roughly six captains who end up doing this route and their crews as a way to make them all themselves all incredibly rich. Because they are the only people in this war who just make a profit the whole way through. They literally make it. They, ne they never have to fight and they're making a profit the whole way through. It is... It is obscene. But because of these captains going into these ports and because of where Porter stops on his way down to the Pacific, which is in these ports, and because Porter doesn't understand the concept of doing anything discreetly and shouts exactly what he's going to do and his crew do is spread it as well exactly where they're going to be where they're going to be basing themselves from you know all their plans the british get a lot of information very quickly a lot of information very quickly at one point this gentleman, Rear Admiral Manley Dixon, who is in charge of the station, who is in charge of the area. He is the commander of South America Station at this point. And, well, he's in charge, basically put in charge for the War of 1812. So he's in charge from 1812 to 1816. He is a very experienced officer. He got praised by Earl St. Vincent for his performance at Cartagena. Now, Earl St. Vincent, Admiral Jervis, is known as being an officer who made, if I give you a frame of reference more modernly, especially for some people who might not have heard of him, uh, Admiral King, who was Chief Naval Officer of the US Navy in World War II, is famously uh, even-tempered. He was angry all the time. Compared to Jervis, he was positively mild-mannered. To say Jervis was hard, nay impossible to impress, is to understate it. There are very few officers who ever earned his 
grudging acceptance, let alone respect, far fewer friendship. Dixon earned all three. He's a good officer. And he is sitting. He is sitting in cut he is sitting in the South America station with his flagship, which is probably the Montague for most of this period, the San Diego, getting inundated with information from all his captains, from all their contacts. And when I say he's getting information, but in data of information, he's getting all the gossip letters sending and sending out letters of his own and talking to them. And he's got a Commodore sitting down in the Pacific. And the Commodore, well, he's James Hillier. And his job with his frigates is to look after the whalers and to deal with any American interference on the Pacific side of South America. There is a discussion often with this mission of what happens if Porter had actually met up with the Constitution, had actually met up with Bainbridge and formed a combined force. Well, I can tell you what happens. At that point, Dixon and his, very importantly, his flagship, the Montague, and probably... I'm going to just suggest this. Probably HMS Indefatigable, his Raze frigate, which had started life as a 64-gun Ardent-class ship of the line, third-rate ship of the line, but which now found itself as a Raze frigate with 26 24-pounder guns, 8 12-pounder guns, uh, 4 42-pounder carronades, and 4 in the sort of quarter deck and 4... 12 pounder guns and two 42 pounder carronades on the forecastle. So let's see, that's uh, 12 12 pounder guns, six 42 pounder carronades, and 26 24 pounder guns, uh, as well as, of course, Montague herself, which is a 74 gun third rate, would have been turning up with Hillier. That is it. That is the simple scenario. Why? Because Constitution would have been a prize. But Constitution is different from Essex. Constitution is a true heavy frigate. Essex is armed with carronades. The British know that a decent sized frigate, one of the large frigates, can take her. And I'll explain why in a bit. They have the information. They get their first reports about A, which frigates it is that are actually go heading down to the Pacific, and B, what weapon systems that frigate has, i.e. what its weapons fit is, within days of their first port visit on their route south. Quite literally. It comes through. And it's, it's an interesting story. It basically comes from a merchant who was listening to a conversation in a pub, went out, former, a former served in the Navy at some point, so knew his guns, was also a merchant sailor, so knew his guns for that reason as well. Pirates are still a thing in the spirit. They might not be as common. They usually find themselves coming on crop with the Royal Navy, but pirates and privateers are still a thing. And so... He'd known what he was looking at, and he managed to verify what he was looking at. There is discussions about whether or not he managed to talk himself onto the ship. But he then went and had dinner that evening with a British frigate captain who is it, who was in harbour, I think. Was it that evening or next day? Something like sort of very close on that ends up having dinner. And then, of course, that go information goes back. I think it was that evening. It must be the next evening because the Essex had left harbour and the British had arrived. So next e it must have been next evening. But it's, it's a wonderful little story and... Honestly, with all these various stories, there are so many sources of them and going around that you don't know which one's true and which one's not and the full extent of the story, because again, it's gossip. And as I've said many, many times, when you're listening to sailors gossip, the tales grow. They do. So they get embellished. And 
history sometimes embellishes them more because historians look for evidence which backs them up and they look and find other, sto other stories and they pull them together and you find a whole story has taken its life and has become the historically accepted course of events and narrative and then you as a current historian are looking back over it and going you can't substantiate any of this there is literally no evidence there it's a it's a possible and it's a a likely story because honestly porter seems to have run the ship security in ports of I'm going to use a phrase, please don't take it as an insult, but a Nordic open prison. Uh, if you haven't been there, the Scandinavian countries are famous because some of them, uh, they do really believe in rehabilita rehabilitation, and they do have some really, really nice, in your, as considered by European terms, open prisons. That are almost sign-in, sign-out systems, for especially prisoners who are able to go out and work during the days, etc., and you know, as they're being rehabilitated in life. That's the level of security. It it's, it's really doesn't look like a secure system at all. There is some security. Obviously, I'm sure there's some security going on. But it, look, it, it doesn't seem to be there, and people can wander in and wander around. So this is the real problem. And the other problem for Porter, I would say, is I'm not going to talk about his command structure at this point, because it doesn't matter. He was supposed to be part of Bainbridge's squadron. Bainbridge, they never meet up. They just never manage to get together. And Constitution is off doing her thing. She's actually under the command of Charles Stewart by this point. He took command in July... 1813 of the Constitution, taking it from Bainbridge. But Bainbridge was supposed to be Commodore of the Squadron and still operating from Constitution. So that would have been an interesting scenario. Um, I, I honestly think that command-wise, that could have been a very problematic scenario because you have a crew which is used to following the orders of one officer and suddenly... That officer is still going to be there, but in a strategic command perspective, perspective, not a tactical command perspective. And it's it would I would, I think that would have been an absolute recipe for an absolute war between him and Stuart. I really do. Um, as it was, it never works out like that, and Stuart's out cruising around doing other things, including capturing the fourteen gun HMS Pik uh, Piktu. Um, in March 1814, about the same time this battle takes place. There are all sorts of issues the Americans have with supplies. There's also the fact that quite a lot of their harbours and quite a lot of their major ports and several of their actual large frigates get blocked up by the, what we'll term, the friendly local 74. Hello! Basically, Imagine this: you've got a you, you see look out on the sea, on the bay, and you're seeing sloops and brigs doing a blockade, maybe a couple of frigates, and you're thinking, as an American frig commander, I can beat all of them. I am more powerful than all of them. And suddenly, a very large set of sails hoves into view. It's got two decks. Oh, it's big. It's moving quite quickly, so it's probably copper bond. It's executing such smart maneuvers. What is coming our way? <gasps> Hello, it's the friendly local 74. I'm here to act as squadron commodore, in, as you know, usually the captain taking command of... The inshore squadron or the blockade squadron, just a senior captain, uh, maybe Commodore Pennant, if I'm lucky. Not Commodore Flack. I won't, I don't, you don't get that at this point in the Royal Navy. Commodore Pennant. Uh, if you're really unlucky, it'll be a Rear Admiral's flagship with a Rear Admiral aboard, because those are often known to not be well-drilled ships. And if it's an important port, it might be more than one or two of them. And some very important ports got some third rates and a second rate, or 
maybe something even more special. Turning up, and um, at that point, many American frigate commanders, even at large frigates, went, I am honorable, I am brave, I'm not suicidal. Because... Could they outrun it? And more importantly, could they outrun the frigates and it? Because if they're caught fighting the frigates, they're not going to be able to maneuver or gain speed. So they can't they can't risk getting in a fight. Because if they do, that 74 will take them. And if there's multiple 74s, it's even worse. And if we think about what does happen to the... American frigates which are captured. That's pretty much the scenario. They run into the blockading squadrons. And it's the British going, yes, you do have these wonderful frigates. Well, you can afford to have them because we need to have hundreds of frigates. So we can't afford to build them all to that size and scale. Whereas you only need a, a dozen or so. Although you've built only six because your Congress are your, greatest na your Navy's greatest enemy. They truly are. But that doesn't matter, because we actually have ships that align, and lots of them. And that's the thing. You don't need a heavy frigate when you have a ship at a line. Because anything you need a frigate for, a regular frigate can do more efficiently in terms of cost to doing that task than a heavy frigate in terms of the frigate duties. Anything you need a heavy frigate for to do in a larger ship duties, a third rate can do even better if you have the money for them. You build the heavy frigate when you don't have enough money for both of those things. So you build something, it's kind of like the tribal class destroyer or the battle cruiser. It's something which is dressed up to be able to do more, but would you really like to be in a tribal class destroyer and do a one-on-one -on -one fight with a cruiser? No. That wasn't what they wanted to do. And I, I know, Battle of Cape Bon notwithstanding, it's not what they're really supposed to do. The fact they win that battle... Okay, torpedoes and radar helped them, okay? We'll go with torpedoes and radar. They weren't... It's... <laughs> And they did find very. It was it was the, the very lightly armored Italian cruisers as well. And I'm I, I'm not diminishing them in any way, but I just realised that entire battle kind of disregards my point of they're not so they are not designed to destroy the ship, which is they're, which they're sort of filling in for, and they did. But in most other battles, although they rarely did find themselves one on one versus a cruiser, that was the only time when they found themselves two on two, and they took out both. There were two other Allied destroyers, a Dutch one and another British destroyer there, but they never actually managed to fire a single shot. The two tribals took them and took out the two Italian cruisers with a straight go. But you get my point. They, they, they can act bigger, they can look bigger, but they're really not going to fight the bigger thing. But here's... This is where problems start to magnify when you have Porter's personality and... Lack of, I would say, strategic acumen out on the battle, out on the glo global stage. Because he is therefore out beyond support with no command structure and no support. There is no other frigate for him to coordinate, for a large frigate for him to coordinate with. There is no big fighting power with him. There is nothing which is going to require the Royal Navy to send a third rate after him. He has got the Essex, but she's armed with carronades. We'll get into that in a second. She's very powerful, but in his view, she, you know, it, 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 the enemy should fight honorably, which means they should close to the range at which his guns could hit them. If the enemy doesn't fight honorably, if they fight smartly and engage at a range at which their guns work and his don't, that's dishonorable and he loses you might be getting the theme of what happens in the battle later, but we'll get to that one. He is coming out with this beautiful slogan, Free Trade and Sailors' Rights. Well, free trade in this scenario largely includes the right to try and trade and carry the trade between both belligerent powers with each other. 
as well as with their colonies. And the thing is, that's a nice in theory thing to shout out, but if you consider that one of the key roles of navies in wartime, and one of the key reasons navies invest in wartime, and the governments invest in navies for wartime, is the ability to shape the economic and commercial world and movement of goods to their will. So calling for that sort of form of free trade kind of erases one of the foundations of a navy. It's also unlikely to ever be carried out by anyone because it would erase the very reason you're investing in a navy. Sailors' rights. Well, that's... As I've said before, you would have made things... Uh, things could be made a lot easier if there had been some sort of paperwork. Um... Sort out, and I realise that some do get paperwork and lose it, is what they claim, and there are others who claim to have had paperwork and lost it, who from areas which didn't produce paperwork, and it was largely left to the states and various local officials to decide whether they had paperwork or not. It's all very, very ad hoc and early American governments, and interesting. And I can, again, I, I, sailors' rights is a lovely thing to shout out, but it's... It's, again, it's it, it's a causing a small problem. It, it, uh, he doesn't really have the same ring he thinks it does. Because he thinks, honestly thinks at one point, he, he seems to believe that either he can get the crew of the Royal Navy frigates to rebel and join him, he does seem to believe he can do that, or that by shouting this loudly, he will get the Chilean public to support him in the fight. Yeah. Hadn't really taken much notice of the fact that the vast majority of the merchant ships in the harbour were British, and the vast majority of the trade, therefore, from Valparaiso Harbour was dependent upon British shipping, and that might therefore affect their allegiance. I'm sure that didn't matter. He was born in uh, 1st February 18, 1780, and he would live to the 3rd of March 1843. He has a rather rapid growth, consistent of his career and promotion, because this is another fact that he managed to see action in, well, pretty much every war before he can. He's in the Quasi War with the French. He's on the Constellation, on the command of John Rogers. And he does well. He is... An ardent officer in terms of going for glory. He really does go for glory. In fact, he's very much a glory hound. Very, very much a glory hound. What do I mean by the fact that he's a glory hound? Why am I saying this? Because imagine this. You are alone in the world. There is no one who can support you. You are a surface raider. Out on the world's oceans. You can only get the sucker you can from neutral ports when you are able to. When their population supports you and befriends you. And you are from a small nation, relatively, in terms of global reach and power at this time. Which is very new to the world. And you're in a war against a global hegemon who can offer those nations, those other small nations, far more. Who can offer them intercession in between scenario, in, you know, into their disputes. Who can affect treaties and bring about friendship or peace. Who can defend them or at least the system, and who has already supported them in their freeing their shackles from Spain. And you are actively going hunting that nation's warships. You actively want to engage them. That's glory hunting. That is seeking something for your own glory, because here is the other problem. Yes, there are a lot of small frigates wandering around there, little small sloops and those things, which he could win glory beating up because they're far smaller, well, like he had with HMS Alert. But there is a reason he avoided the silver frigates. 
There is a reason he avoided the South America squadron. There is a reason he avoided all those forces. He can't deal with a real frigate. He doesn't have the guns. And yes, he'll later on blame someone who had been his ardent supporter in political terms, the naval secretary, for him not having cannon rather than carronades. But he hadn't complained when he'd been fitted out and sent out with them. He hadn't complained when he'd been given the command to go. Yes, he blames the carronades, but he was one of the ones who actually thought that they were a good thing. Because after all, if he closed, it would give him far more power. One small problem, of course, was what happens if you come up against a commander who's smart enough to fight you in a way which means you can't close? And this is ultimately his problem, because, well, he is up against someone who had been born in 1769. So... About 11 years earlier, let's say, well, as it's late 1769 versus early 1780, let's say a decade or so earlier. And had been in service since 1780, when he'd been born. And would live also till 1843. And who'd already won quite a lot of glory at the Battle of Tamatav. And had done so in other battles as well. He had glory. He was a veteran commander. He was the type of commander who was solid. He is not, and I will get into this at certain points, he is certainly not linguistically inventive with slogan writing. He needs someone else to be sitting there coming up with his pivy, uh, pivy slogans. But he is definitely very good at marshalling intelligence and information. He is an expert at assessment and is an expert at assessing what is the right and sensible tactics. He is a very experienced, very well-trained officer who has probably spent more time in combat than the entire officers, all the officers aboard the Essex combined. Honestly, he has been involved in fights in his career from basically the first year of service onwards. Every single war that the British have been involved in since 1780 onwards, every single campaign, he's been somewhere there. He's been promoted, he's skilled, he's capable. He is a frigate officer through and through. Yeah. He's who you want down in South America at this point. So let's consider the ships. Now, she was a fairly good sailing ship. She'd actually been commanded by William Bainbridge on a previous cruise uh, during the First Barbary War and had been part of Richard Dale's um, squadron. She was a fifth-rate frigate in technical, uh, in technical terms. She's fully rigged and has a top speed of 11.4 knots. Now, I will say this is the first interesting point that I will raise. 11.4 knots is her top speed if everything's good. HMS Phoebe's top speed is 13 knots if everything's good. Phoebe was in a much better condition than Essex was. When and during the events we're talking about. On around the 28th of March, 1814. So when Porter tries to claim that he felt he could have outrun, or other people suggest, yes, he, he could have outsailed. He could have managed to get away. No. There is only one chance he could have got away, and that is if the moment they had come into, the British had come into the harbour, he had waited until they were docked 
and then had hoisted his anchor and left uh, after sending a note asking him to be requesting them to be held back for 24 hours as a neutral port was requested to do. He didn't do that. He couldn't do that. He hadn't finished taking on supplies. He'd been actually waiting for the British to come to him because he wanted to fight the British. But she is armed with 40 32-pounder carronades and six 12-pounder guns. So she's a, a well-armed vessel, you could say, in terms of weight of firepower. But not so much in range of firepower. She was definitely outranged by pretty much everyone who's a decent sized warship. And a decently armed frigate. She's a fairly decent fifth rate, but she's really quite short ranged in her firepower. Which is one of the reasons why, when she becomes a British frigate, she gets rearmed with 18 pounder guns, which have a longer range. She still keeps 12 for 32 pounder carronades on her quarter deck and two on her forecastle, along with two 9 pounder guns on the forecastle. But her main deck is 26 18 pounder guns to give her actual range because the British learn from the fighting experience. HMS Phoebe, in contrast, well, she's a Phoebe class frigate, which is uh, an interesting vessel. She's one of four frigates which are faster versions of the Perseverance class frigates. And she'd been ordered in 1794. So, yeah. She is older than Essex, but she's been well kept up by the British. She's been well used. In fact, she's been so well used, her Naval General Service Medal, and I'm going to make sure I get this right, so I'm going to read it from list, has clasps for the 21st of December, 1797, which was an action, the 19th of February, 1801, another frigate action, the Battle of Trafalgar, uh, Tamatav on the 20th of May, 1811, Java, and the 28th of March, 1814. Of course, the battle we're talking about. She would be with the Royal Navy and finally sold off in 1841. Okay, yes, yeah, she's used for other things. She is um, used as various forms of, well, hulk is what they're usually grouped into. But she had done a lot of actions and a lot of capabilities, and she becomes a receiving slot ship hulk. Uh, but she's, yeah, not brought, sold off for breaking up till 1841, and her hull is assessed at several points and considered in good enough condition for possible reaction reactivation should they need her. So she's a well-built ship, and she's armed with 26, as you can see, 26 18-pounders, 8 9-pounder guns and 6 32-pounder carronades, and 2 9-pounder guns and 4 32-pounder carronades. So, yeah, she's a 36-gun fifth, uh, fifth rate, and that means, by the way, we're talking about 36 guns on a fifth rate and all these things, we're talking about how many guns she's pierced for. A ship might carry more guns than she's pierced for. So the pierced for are the guns on the gun deck. Pretty much, and some of the ones they might be pierced for, for on the forecastle and aft. But they could have, a, have other weapons which they have added in. Maybe they have fired them over the railings. May, uh, maybe they fired them. Um, they, they've done their own crew ad hoc piercings for, etc. So often a ship which is a 36 gun ship as in this case, carries a lot more than 36 guns. Carries a lot more. We're talking closer to 46. And as again, the important thing is speed. Speed. Then we have HMS Cherub which is a Cormorant class 18 gun sloop. One of those ships which normally really should be avoiding the Essex. One of the ships which, frankly, the Essex would normally wolf up because she's got 16 32-pounder carronades, 
six 18 pounder carronades, two six pounder chase guns, and two 18 pounder carronades on the fort in the forecastle. She is really not armed to fight the Essex. But she's, like many ships which make up, the vast hundreds of ships the Royal Navy maintains for convoy escorts and presence missions and just providing enough vessels to be in enough places at the same time. But as fire support, she's rather useful for the Phoebe. Because let's consider the full contest. And the Essex Junior, there is even less information about. So, frankly, I just thought I'd just put her in. i put the table here. She's armed with 10 18 pounder carronades and 10 6 pounder long guns. So, she really, really shouldn't get involved in any of the fight. And you can see why she was pretty much ign she was ignored for the entire fight. If you are looking at this, you soon realise that in terms of weights of short-range firepower, the Essex has overwhelming broadside weight. In fact, her cumulative broadside weight is very nearly the same as the combined cumulative broadside weight of the Phoebe and Cherub. If you get into a close-range fight with the Essex, you are stupid. You are a moron of the First Order. However, if you have superior speed, and you have a well-trained crew and a decent captain, and you have a overwhelming cannon broadside weight, a longer range fire, a cannon broadside weight which alone is roughly three times, well, actually, no, four times. Very nearly five times, but roughly four. At least four and a half times. That's been uh, four times. Let's be, just be kind to everyone. Four times the cumulative weight of all the other ships there in terms of broadside weight. So you have got the ship that has the far superior long range fire. This will explain all the battle that happens and all the events which take place. Because if you were Phoebe, if you are Hillier in command of Phoebe, how would you fight this battle? Now, before you go forward, it, and this is what I want you to think. And if, think about it. Before we go further in this video, please, and this is not the final question, but this is the uh, you know question for this point. Think about it. Put a comment below. If you are in this in charge of this fight and you are the captain of Phoebe, how are you going to fight this battle in this scenario? Are you going to close the short range? Would you really do that? Because according to Porter's reports and some of his stuff he publishes later on, which are taken verbatim by many, that would be the honourable thing to do. Really? Against that? It's honourable to go, yes, I will close the short range and, what, get my crew killed? There are many definitions of honour which are sometimes bandied around. But I have never subscribed to any method or any form of honour which involves me needlessly sacrificing those whom I lead. And honestly, I hope no one ever would. I do not consider that honourable behaviour. They are, broadly speaking, equivalent ships. Honestly, Phoebe is slightly longer, but also slightly beamier than Essex. She's also heavier. But as said, she is the faster hull design and the faster hull. She is the 13 knot ship here. She's probably the fastest ship here. There is a debate because the captain of the Cherub, one of the captains of the Cherub, claims he got fast in her. I I doubt that. 
I, I, I doubt the cherub got as fast as he claims. He, he, he did claim he was going over 13 knots, but um, I think that's a nice dream. I, I don't think that's reality. So I think I'm say I feel I'm safe to say that Phoebe is the fastest here, because I know the speed of the Essex at best, and I have an, a very good idea of what the speed of the Essex Junior was. So, with all that said, here is the problem for this whole scenario, and the first big problem for Porter. He's done far rather well. He's Capture some ships. They, I'll be talking about their fates later, but the vast majority of them do not get back. The vast majority of them do not get back to America. He's captured some. He's doing well. But it's not the glory he's got. It's not the glory he wanted. And, well... This causes an issue. He decides to go hunting glory. Again. Renewed vigour. He wants glory. He wants it. He doesn't realise there is a net closing around him. That the ships have slowly been moving into position. No. He is going actually hunting for that net which is closing around him. Porter had actually made for Valapriso. In fact, he'd arrived there on the 12th of January, 1814. He'd expected help. He'd received some from the Carrera family, a very politically influential family of Chile in that period, um, who'd been incredibly important to their independence struggle. But um, they were in jail by this point because they got themselves into trouble with issues. It, the thing is, revolutions have a habit and rebellions have a habit of eating some of their leaders. And this was definitely the case going on. Because someone always goes a bit far or pushes the edges a little bit too much. And there was also a bit of a civil war. And I will say a bit of a civil war. Um... It broke it out in, Ch in Chile at this time. The, the, there are issues with Peru, and there's a Spanish counterattack being expected. So he arrives to rather less support than he was expecting, and he's arrived in har in this harbour on the 12th of January, 1814. He's still waiting there on the 3rd of February, 1814, when Phoebe and Cherub arrive. You see, he'd been going hunting for the British. Then he decided what he was going to do is sit somewhere and wait for them to come to him. Think about that. That's like the Graf Spey. Instead of it having the Battle of River Plate, though, I don't know, sailing into Montevideo and sitting there, advertising to the world where it is, while the British bring forces there to fight it. When they arrived, well, Hillier goes straight to work. He already has some attention. He already has some agreements in place. He already understands some of the local people in the area. He already has contacts. Again, the British Gossip Group. The fact is, he has friends there. And there's actually a British merchant vessel. Uh, the Emily. Under the command of a British merchant. Captain George O'Brien. Which sail out of Alapriso almost immediately on Hillier, arri Hillier arriving with intelligence about Essex, the latest information. There's also notes brought to him from a Mr. Corrington and Andrew Bless and several others on the latest of the political situation in Chile. These are local British agents. And there are Chilean merchants as well, 
who are all not only providing with information, but he is getting ample confirmation over exactly what sh American ship is in the harbour, who's in charge, what their crew is, and what they're armed with. So the thing is, the person who best knows these stats at this point of every single ship involved is Hillier. Helia basically knows this stuff. So this is your problem. He knows that. Porter doesn't know. Porter has no idea what the Phoebe's like. He's looking at her and presuming it's a standard British ship. So he's probably presuming it's got the uh, various guns. It, he, he, he's certain it's got the 18-pounders because that's the British standard thing. But realistically, he doesn't know... The commander, he doesn't know the ship's history, he doesn't know any other details about this ship because, again, there are a huge number of British frigates. Which one is that? Which officer is that? To have an information network about those sort of things, to have that sort of information, would be a very complicated scenario for the Americans to take on and provide their officers, and they don't have that kind of network in place. Whereas, for the British, oh yeah, Hillier's had full letters from Dixon, Manly Dixon, with all sorts of details that have been accrued from the various points of the Essex's journey down the coast and around the South America. At this point, he probably knows what I don't know, what Porter likes for breakfast. In fact, I'm certain he does. Porter was aiming for a jewel. This is the reality. He's aiming for glory. And what he finds himself in is a blockade. Because the thing is, you can't fight in a, a neutral harbour. It's illegal, even at this time. And neutral harbour territory is taken as within cannon range of any fortifications or the harbour. That is the territorial waters of a nation at this point. Cannon range. It's still the basis of territorial waters to this day. Cannon range. Now here is the point I talk about, because when Hillier arrives, he sails into the harbour of Valparaiso very closely to Essex. Um, Essex had actually rigged kedge anchors at the end of its yard so it could grapple Phoebe and Gage. But Hillier notices this and hauls away. He has no intention of fighting at close range in Valapriso Harbour. He has no attempt to do it. There is an argument whether Hillier had been attempting to cause Essex to fire first in order to violate the Chilean neutrality mm, by bringing the ship close. I don't think so. You see, Hillier to me is playing chess. And in chess, sometimes you do sacrifice some pawns to get the get the queen. You do that. It's what you do in chess. You have to sometimes, because your opponent is smart enough that gives you the options. But sometimes, sometimes what you do is you take your knight and you dance across the board in front of them and see what they do. You're not Engaging them and hoping they attack the knight. If they do, it shows you their nerves. I think Hillier sailed the route he did to get the measure of the man himself. He got lots of reports. I don't think he wanted Porter to fire on him. I didn't think he put, I would think Porter would be so silly as to do it, although later actions would kind of prove him wrong in some of the ways. Porter conducted himself, but I think he was testing to see what he was dealing with, how nervous Porter was, how much of Porter was bluff, 
And the fact that Porter was rigging himself for, I don't know, f for grappling in harbour. Let's put it this way. If that had been a French ship in a neutral harbour in the middle of a war, would they have rigged themselves to grapple? Probably not. Some might do, but a confident, experienced commander is going to go, no, I'm not going to do that because that makes me look afraid and I know in neutrality they're not supposed to do that. So I'm going to let neutrality protect me to an extent. They would do things like have their crew ready below decks. Things which weren't obvious. Obvious confidence. Project confidence, prepare for the dam uh, prepare for the worst. What Porter had done was show his eagerness for combat. He's shown what he wanted. He wanted to fight. At this point, Porter's coming across less as a frigate captain, a calculating officer, and almost as a rabid dog. He's so eager for that duel, for that fight. And he wants to fight it his way. He wants to get close, because that's where he's strong. I do understand that, but... Yeah. The problem at this point, though, is that Essex is faster than Cherub, I would say. I would agree. I would say, and I think Andrew Lambert wrote that as well. But Phoebe is faster than him. And if he had sent a note saying, I'm going to proceed to sea, you have to keep them in harbour. He could have got out, and let's be honest, if he'd ended up fighting Cherub, that's not good for Cherub. Cherub gets bushwhacked in that fight. And with a 24-hour advantage, could Phoebe find him? Probably considering what Porter would do, which is go to another port and uh, shout about his position and his great victory, yes. What would happen in that case? Well, there are some more Phoebe-like frigates on their way, so it would end up being a mob scenario. But Porter doesn't do that. And one of the reasons he can't do that is because he put so much effort into rigging his ship for a close-quarter engagement and boarding action. It wasn't actually re that re easy to get it ready to go to sea. And so... Phoebe is able to, how do I put this, ready herself quite, uh, ready herself and get her things done. Next day, Porter being enga heavily engaged in love of psychological warfare, apparently, side, uh, raises his sign of free trade and sailors' rights. At this point, I will say this, and I'm going to say this, he is certainly more of a snappy linguist politician type than Hillier because Hillier's response is to consider this an insidious effort to shake the loyalty of British seamen. Um, there's a dispute over whether it's faultless British seamen or British seamen. So Phoebe hosts a St. George's ensign with God and country, British sailors best rights, traitors offend both. And play God Save the Queen, a uh, King. <sighs> okay, Hillier is very good at many things, but uh, like I'm criticizing Porter, he should never have been in charge of his own propaganda efforts. He's really not his skill set. I mean, really not. Oh, I don't think politics are his skill set. There is a reason he has not be uh, doesn't go higher than a rear admiral. As good as he is, there is a reason he doesn't go hard on a rear admiral, and that's politics, and his ability to actually do politics. And you need some ability with the gift of the gab and phraseology to do the politics of higher than a rear admiral. There, uh, Porter, mm, 
then parades his crew in through Valparaiso with flags on, uh, with the flags of the American slogans and going, "Yay! Look at we're parading." Um, that mainly actually annoyed the Chilean merchants by blocking their streets. It was supposed to get support, but he didn't tell the officials he was doing it. He just goes marching. So, imagine this. You basically have... It's, uh, it's a cross between a... You know, as I said, it's a rabid dog looking for a fight or a thoughtless golden retriever which just goes bouncing through the streets going, Woof, 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 look at me. It's a wonderful scenario. Really, really. It's, it's a beautiful scenario, but honestly, it's having no effect on either side. And honestly, the sailors on both ships didn't care. Let's be honest, the Royal Navy sailors at this point were looking at the Essex and going, prize money. Because they knew their captain. They knew what he was good for. And the American sailors had great faith in Porter because he was an inspiring speaker. He was just really not good at his job. While this was going on, Porter agreed to exchange his British prisoners with Hillier's American prisoners. Oh yes, Phoebe's been collecting American ships, the same as um, Porter has been. And as they both docked in Valparaiso, this was perfectly fine. At this point, there is probably the most fun scenario taking place. Whilst they're docked, Porter doesn't go and take a single look at Phoebe. He peers at her occasionally from his ship, but that's it. Hillier, well, he gets out, walks around the dock, and actually come uh, and starts wandering along literally peer side and taking a good look at the Essex and looking at her. There are accounts of him wandering into inns and specifically there was one which had some high rooms and he actually booked a room for the day. And they thought he might want a... Um, friend to join him, a local friend to come join him. He didn't. He, he, he didn't want anyone to come join him. No. What he was doing, far more importantly for him, was spending time looking out the window and from across the street studying the Essex. He's Doing, he's got boats wandering around. He's got all sorts. He is gathering information like anything. He's also talking to people. He's going to dinners. He's doing. He is collecting as much information. He knows every single merchant Porter's trading with. He knows pretty much what he's buying. Uh, this is the worst case scenario you can really have. You have a very thorough professional up against someone who is a bit of a dramaticist, for want of a better phrase. And, well, with Hillier having got all the stores he needed for Phoebe and for Cherub, he went out to sea again on Valentine's Day, the 14th of February. This meant that from not only was the, it was Essex now detained at least till the 15th of February, but it meant both the British ships were now firmly positioned outside of the harbour. And so Essex is inside with Essex Jr. If it goes out, it has to go past them. 
Let's think about it again. They're in harbour for 11 days. Now, to an extent, Phoebe is kept all in that period very quickly able to go to sea. For example, if Hill during Hillier's personal reconnaissance missions, um, if they needed to go to sea immediately or get start going to sea immediately, he had it set, set so that if the signal went up or if they spotted Essex going for emotions, they would go to sea as quickly as they could and he would join them by boat. They had a boat crew sitting waiting for him. So he would catch up with them. They weren't to wait for him. They would get to sea in position first. And that's important. Um, the question is whether he would have beaten Porter out in the boat. And... With the pace Porter seems to move, and the way Porter seems to like to telegraph his blows, honestly, I'm fairly sure they would have done. Because as it goes on, it gets worse. And Porter gets worse. I, I swear... Hillier gets more and more in Porter's mind, and Porter, Hillier starts potentially to become a dis bogeyman to Porter in some regards. Now, at this point, the British ships are lying outside the range of Chilean coastal guns, so they are not in Chilean waters, but they're still within range they can send boats into the harbour to receive fresh beef and water and information. And boats can come out to them. Now, this is where things start getting really bad. Because almost two weeks later, on the 25th of February, Porter decides he's not getting his prize, the Hector, out. He's not getting it out. It's just not happening. And so if he's not going to get it out, then he's going to destroy it rather than give it to the British, uh, give it, uh, get, let the British get it back. He could have sold it in Valapriso. He could have tried to sell it, but he didn't. He actually tows it to sea and burns it in Valapriso Bay inside the harbour area. That's a violation of Chilean neutrality because it's within range of their cannons. It's in their waters. This massively insults the Chilean governor. Remember the same person who's been dealing with Porter sitting there for several months. Who has had to deal with Porter disrupting his city with parades. Who has had to deal with Porter being Porter, which is usually led to him insulting quite a lot of people. And remember at this point also Porter is... Uh, the fact is that Porter had been friends with the politicians who were not of the faction which was now in charge. They were the faction now in jail. So this insults the governor so much he sends dispatches to Hillier saying he would ignore any action taken by the British, should the Essex be taken in harbour after having insulted Chilean neutrality so much. He would not take the ship himself, as he did not wish to embroil Chile directly in the war. However, he would ignore any action taken by the British. Hillier decides that to violate neutrality in such a way would actually be beyond the power of the governor to actually ignore United States process, uh, protest, but also it would set a precedent which would be problematic in the future. And he really doesn't need to. Because he's already started work on his plan. There are, remember, two replacements on their... Uh, two, well, not replacements, but reinforcements on their way. Courtesy of Dixon. Courtesy of Dixon, there are ships on their way. And this is a problem because with these sh uh, with two more frigates on their way to reinforce him, the time is ticking down. The time when Essex actually might have a chance is ticking down.
it then gets worse, okay? He's burnt his prize. What will he do on the 27th of February? Well, this point, Essex and Essex Jr. both set their sails. And... They go out, but they don't go into international waters. They're still neutral waters. And Porter fires a signal gun to Essex Jr. And then proceeds to, to fire two shots at Phoebe to issue a challenge for a duel. Uh, don't worry, this gets worse in a bit. Hillier did not return fire. Porter therefore decides to run in turn in the port and then goes to the Chilean governor to complain about Hillier violating neutrality. Literally, he goes to the governor and says, look, they've been firing, they're blockading me. And literally, he had been firing in front of the port itself with the governor watching on. And the governor had watched which ships had fired. At this point, the governor, who was already, as you can heard earlier, predisposed to allow the British and Hillier to do whatever the frigate he likes to this annoying American officer in front of him, is probably sitting there going, only the bounds of moral code are preventing me from stabbing you right now with this very large sword I'm carrying. Or possibly just thumping you for being annoying and causing me trouble. Unfortunately for Porter... Helia manages to get a note to the governor to respond to his accusations. So it's on formal papers. And these point out that the burning of Hector on 20th of February, the firing of the two shots at Phoebe on 27th of February, and the attempt to board the Phoebe on the 12th of March. Because it takes a couple of weeks of complaining from Porter to get his mean. By the time he does... He's already tried to do a boarding action of sending boats out um, to board the, uh, to, to board the Phoebe. Unfortunately for him, um, Hillier received so many notes telling him the boarding action's coming. It's actually it, there, there was a discussion in live when I was talking about this of whether it, you know it would be a comedic session if it was kept interrupting his dinner. But he quite literally receives notes. Uh, a boat comes out from the. Merchant Guild Association of Valaprizo, uh, the Chilean, the local Merchant Guild Association, uh, a, boat, a boat comes out from the British merchants, a boat comes out from the British agents, a boat, com a boat comes out from the Chilean governor, and another two boats come out on their own cognizance, all to tell him what Porter's planning on doing. Porter is planning on sending two boats to try and get close, load of men, to board and surprise Phoebe at night. There are like seven boats which come out to warn Hillier that Porter's planning this. More boats go out to warn Hillier than Porter was planning on sending. That is, that's embarrassing for so many people in this scenario. It, it's just, it's terrible. At this point, Porter writes a challenge to Hillier, offering a single ship jewel. Now, these were not without precedent. They were not without precedent in the War of 1812. But as a rule, the, whilst they were offered, they were usually not accepted. And... When they were accepted, it, it, it often ended up with the person who'd been offering the battle not having a fun time. But there had been single ship jewels and they were a well attempt, a well known method of achieving glory. But the trouble is, you've got Hillier on the other side. A. Eh? 
he's a Commodore, not a captain. B, he's already got a clasp, which is on his uh, on him. C, he's uh, which clasp, which is literally decorated on his Naval Service Medal for his own action, Tamatave. And C, he is. He's just not gonna do it. He goes no. If you come out, it's a fight. But if you don't come out, I don't care. At this point, Neris and Targus are already nearly there. They are the two of the ships coming to reinforce, but Dixon actually has had reinforcements himself. And he'd heard that maybe one of the large frigates of the US Navy might make a break from it to come and join Porter. They might actually be going to do this. He'd heard discussions from merchants who'd been in American ports who'd heard this. It's just the amount of gossip going around. It's amazing. So he sends a third frigate to reinforce. So there is HMS Britain also on the way. At this point, you are basically dealing with a scenario where very soon Essex could find itself facing off against a task force or squadron of roughly four frigates of Phoebe size and capability and Cherub, plus potentially another couple of sloops as well were heading in that direction. This is a large formation. But it's an ongoing blockade. On the 23rd of March, Hillier is warned that Porter would sortie, uh, would sortie soon. But at this point, Porter learns that Hillier's got reinforcements coming in and not far away, so he has to sortie soon. Porter receives information that they are very, very close. He's got days, maximum week, to get away before these reinforcements arrive. He hasn't. Um, I, I, I will say they actually... How do I put this politely? They didn't arrive till the 13th of April. That's Tagus Neris. 13th of April. So that's about two, three weeks from this point. But it doesn't matter. Porter knows they're coming. He knows they're going to be soon. So he's preparing himself and he's buying supplies and doing all things to ready for his voyage. Because he's got to get out. Because his only chance is to go before they get reinforcements. Now... This is really interesting because it does kind of smack of the story of the Graf Spey, trapped in Montevideo Harbour, Captain Langsdorff wondering what to do, and suddenly the information comes out thanks to a deliciously unencoded open phone call from the em from the embassy mission in Montevideo to the one in Bu uh, to the uh, one in. Um, in Buenos Aires. No. In Brazil. Not Argentina. And it was all about uh, saying where British ships were. Apparently they'd been spotted by the lighthouse and they needed fuel to be arranged for them. And of course this gets repeated by the papers very quickly and the information is fed directly to the Germans and they hear it all and they're going, oh, there are these big warships nearby. And of course, they're nowhere nearby. They're nowhere nearby. They're coming, but they're not that close. Well, Porter seems to be hearing, A, that those ships are very, very close when actually, as I think I've mentioned, they don't actually arrive till April, till a couple of weeks into April. 
So this is the 20th. They, they're about three weeks away. But he thinks they're coming and they're going to be there over the next week. There's also debate as to how big he thinks they're going to be. Because when he writes up afterwards, he's seen that they're two frigates. Afterwards, he's seen they're two frigates. But at the time, his actions seem to make him make it look like he thinks that the British ships coming are at least a Raze is included in numbers, if not a full 72. He seems to be really quite confused about what's coming. But he tries some cunning plans to get himself to see. Some ruses. First, he sends his purser ashore to buy goods. Looked like he's not going to see. Because he's ordering stuff, so therefore he can't be going to see. And I am absolutely certain that Hillier got his shopping list and saw what he was ordering. He also sends a boat out under the command of Lieutenant Mori, uh, Mori that night um, with blue lights and to launch rockets to hopefully uh, make Hillier c decide that Essex is going to escape, uh, you know, in a certain direction to leeward, preferably, at daybreak. And so he think he you know he to look like he's moving in that direction. The thing is, there are a couple of problems with this. A. Hillier spots the lights, but he sees no ships, so he decides a decoy, and takes both Phoebe and Cherub to windward, rather than leeward, the exact direction where Essex is hoping to go. Anticipating Porter's plans. Also point out that Lieutenant Maury in, uh, was possibly shadowed by a boat from the shore, uh, from the uh, from the city itself as well. So who knows how much information um, Hillier got? If you consider it compared to earlier periods, the odds of him getting a boat telling exactly what was going on is very, very high. I mean, Porter has managed to annoy the entire local population. 28th of March, Porter's very, very disappointed to notice that Phoebe and Cherub are sitting at the weather point of the bay, going, we're waiting. Hillier was with those two, with both ships wearing inside and out of the point, just holding his position in the wind, and really setting himself, just giving himself room to manoeuvre. But Porter is now fixed on a plan. So instead of going, oh, look, they're, they're lying right in the way of my plan. So, and that's the direction of the best wind as well today. So honestly, this isn't going to work. So I'm not going to do this. No, no, he, he's going for glory. And so he strikes his royal mass, um, his royal mass and yards at uh, 1425 hours. And then... Essex's cables part apart soon after, making the break for the sea. Helia, Helia immediately alters course to cut Porter off. Unfortunately, at this point, Porter has his first extra bit of bad luck. Or rather, maybe it's karma. Maybe it's the Chilean governor's prayers to whatever deity he's believing in at that point that day to get vengeance on his behalf for the, uh, for the annoyance. But there's a sudden squall. And this sudden squall takes away Essex's main topmast. And, well, as you can see... She's kind of damaged at that point. So not only was she slower originally, but she's now lost quite a lot of extra sail area, which does affect speed. Two men, two of her crew, Samuel Miller and Thomas Brown, were also lost with the topmast. At 15.10 hours, Hillier makes the signal for chase. And Phoebe and Cherub hoist the St. George's flag with those lovely words, God and country, British sailors, best rights, traitors offend both aboard. 
Good God. Please, please, I beg of you. If you're not good at something, get someone who is good at it to do it for you if you're in charge. If you're not good at coming up with slogans, there is no shame in getting someone there to do the slogans for you. Just remember that they basically are your PR person and you've got to be very careful how you manage them or they'll end up taking everything over and making it all about the image of things rather than the reality of them. And they'll end up confusing you. They're continuing, though. Both strips are continuing their, um, their, their, their war of words which have no effect and actual on anything. So I'm just going to ignore it from now on. Just note both sides are flying their flags of words and glory. Porter realised at this point he had no chance of escape, so he wore Essex to starboard and cut away the wreckage. He's unable to get back into port and so drops anchor in a small bay out of the sight of the nearest Chilean fort. Now, if you're out of sight of a fort, what do you think you're also out of? <sighs> Firing range of the fort's cannon, which means you're no longer in neutral waters. This is what Hillier's been waiting for. And let's be honest, even if they had been in even if there had been a mobile battery nearby, at this point in their relationship, the governor would probably have ridden out there himself to move that battery out of range. He would have literally ridden as hard as he could to the battery himself. Not send a messenger, no. He'd have gone himself and gone, move. And then probably hoist the flag saying, no guns here, fire away, engage. Stop this man causing me stress and strain. But no, he didn't need to. There are no guns in range, so it's not neutral waters anymore. As said, the, the Chilean governor was overjoyed and not at all probably watching on in any way, shape or form. Now, with her unable to sail back to protection, she is flying her free her ensigns, as said, and uh, she's got the United States colours from the Mizzen Peak. Including, and I, I, I will say this, Porter is also not necessarily the best at slogans. Free trade and sailors' rights is snappy. His other one, God our country and liberty, tyrants offend them. Has he been inspired by Hillier? Who is really, it's really not a good phrase for him. So, yeah, just, no, no, just stop it. Um, now, of course, Hillier's happy. She's in his national waters, so he signals the cherub at 16 tenaz to fight at anchor roving extra cables to the anchor so the ship can be worn around and broadside brought a pair but most want you to keep range don't get close he sails phoebe with the intent on bringing her broadside to bear on essex's stern and remember essex has anchored and has damaged her mass already before you even got a fight she's really not mobile the actual battle begins at 1620 hours at roughly 250 yards, 230 meters, half gunshot range. This is why Phoebe was still moving. She opens up on Essex's stern. She has literally managed to get around, uh, get round, get in position to engage. This picture is not quite right because... Um, well, A, Phoebe is a two-decker in this scenario, a full, uh, full two-decker, that, so that's not quite right, and so is um, two full gun decks and two full gun decks on the Essex, but, you know, and there's also the fact that she was, head she was around the stern. It's made probably later in the battle, they're trying to imagine. Phoebe was... Opening far stern starboard quarter area. And Cherub positioned herself to fire at Essex's bow. The long 12 pounder chase guns uh, from Essex caused Commander Tucker, uh, Tucker of Cherub to be badly wounded and to move closer to Phoebe. 
He remained on deck, though, during the entirety of the action. Didn't go down. As badly wounded as was, didn't go down. Porter does, in the points of being a good, a good officer and trying his best, does try to bring his guns to bear. He attempted to spring rove his anchor cable and using the anchor cable to swing Essex around. But they keep being shot away. In fact, it's almost like... I'm sure this isn't the case, but it's, it's like Hillier had told his gunners that if they saw anyone playing around the anchor cables, whether they were the marksmen sitting up above or in the sharpshooters sitting up in the tops or the gunners on their gun uh, on the cannon if you see someone moving around or something moving around on the anchor destroy it we don't want them being able to move and the thing is they have an advantage because they have Long range, they have cannon. They are they are longer range than carronades. The whole point of carronade is it uh, gives you a heavier shot but a shorter range, but it requires usually less crew to actually operate the gun. So it's a really good weapon for merchant ships. It's not a good necessarily a good weapon for warships. At this point, though, they have actually got a bit close. Hillier's plan of keeping at range, he's got overexcited. And despite Porter's often claim that, you know, the 32 pounders did no damage, actually were being quite devastating in their own way against Phoebe. Um, they mortally wounded her first lieutenant, and so Hillier is forced to increase range. This is really useful, though, at this point, because Essex has actually been firing this masting shot at Phoebe to try and limit her ability to actually get to see, uh, actually keep her speed up. And by increasing range, they manage to stop that. And while she's got her sheets cut, mainsail cut up, the jibbon damaged, and foremast, and main and mizzen stays shot away, as soon as they're out of carronade range, Hillier has his crew mending the rigging and furling the mainsail and looking after things. And you can actually see this thing sent in this picture. But what he also starts to do is starts to realise that the damage he's doing to the Essex, his plan is working. Up until that point, he wasn't sure. Um, he hails Tucker at this point to keep the cherub underway instead of fighting at anchor. And to keep up the maneuverability and make sure to keep the distance. And he approaches the Essex again, but he does it in a different way. He tries to keep his distance and maneuver. He's using his nine pounder guns, he's using his his eighteen pounders, he's using everything he can, and he's using a range. And he's keeping to roughly half a mile range. At seventeen 35 hours, they're still receiving steady fire from the Essex. But Hillier is far more capable of returning fire and actually far more capable of hitting his target. The 18 pounders were still effective, whilst the carronades were mostly hitting water. And when I say mostly hitting water, the ones which weren't hitting water were hitting rocks. They're not hitting Phoebe. They don't have the range. When the wind picked up at about 17.45 hours, Porter cuts his cable and tries to sail towards Phoebe with the intent to board her. Hillier is over, a little over half a mile away and immediately sets sail and avoids the Essex. He's more than capable to. He's got his masts and his sails all repaired. Essex hasn't had a ship being able to repair theirs, and Essex is the slower ship. In fact, Essex's rigging was so shredded, it actually made her hard to control. And so Phoebe is easily able to keep range, 
and continue firing and devas and you know firing at the Essex and continue smashing her, cutting down her crew. but mostly cutting down her rigging. In fact, Hillia had been purposely targeting this one we do know. We don't know about the the cables, but we do know that in terms of the rigging and the upper deck and the masts, that Hillia had been targeting that throughout the battle to make sure Essex couldn't get away, because he knew if he took out that, Essex is going nowhere, and he can just sit where he likes and pummel them until they have a surrender or sink he doesn't care. His job is to, his objective is to eliminate the threat. Is to eliminate the Essex. Whether he captures it, that'd be nice, his crew would really like that. Or whether he sinks it, the government won't complain. And Dixon will support him and so will the Admiralty. At this point... Hillier starts to realise that the fire dropping off from the Essex is not just because of the range, it's also because the guns aboard Essex have been disabled. Many have been shot off their carriages, some have been damaged in other ways. And even worse, in a sign of complete command breakdown aboard the Essex, a pile of powder had exploded near Essex's main hatch. Now, think about that. Why, am I, why is that a problem? Well, if, in a battle like this, you would expect it, an NCO or someone, a gunner's mate or someone, to have spotted the pile of powder which we dropped, because that happens in battles, and either bucket of water or bucket of sand on it to stop it being a fire risk. Bucket of water, bucket of sand, chucked over it. Preferably both. And you have the buckets positioned around the ship, ready to go. You have them there. These things happen, you deal with it. But the thing is, the entire command structure is disintegrating aboard the Essex at this point. Their entire NCO leadership, their officer leadership, everything's breaking down. They are completely overwhelmed. Porter is traumatised, the phrase often put around, by the casualties, by what's going on. He's into shell shock already and the battle's still going on he's completely overwhelmed by this scenario he never expected he was looking for a glorious battle and instead he's being annihilated and he can't do anything he's impotent in this fight it's devastating for him on an emotional and psychological level and Essex is just drifting at this point Porter tries one last throw of the dice. He orders the Essex to be run ashore and blown up. This was the same order which, of course, James Lawrence had given on uh, had said for the Chesapeake when Shannon took her. However, the wind once again died down. Whoever, whichever deity the uh, governor of Valaprizo was praying to, was definitely not going to allow Porter that joy. I'm going with the governor of Valaprizo because I can't imagine anyone was praying quite as much for Porter's demise at this point. It's very rare for a governor to literally offer the other power in a war which they're neutral in the right to come in and smash a ship up. That is not something you do just to curry favour with one side. That is, I am really, really annoyed with this one. Do what you like. He's annoying me. And the wind dies down. And so there's no hope of making it ashore. There's no hope of escape. There was never much hope of escape, honestly. Uh, turning their stern again on Phoebe was just not a good idea. She'd have just shredded them more. I don't think they've ever made it to actually shore to, to ashore they could actually run themselves ashore and keep their crew alive. Especially as many of their boats have been destroyed by this point. There was no chance them getting off her. At this point, so many of the crew were also wounded that they couldn't even abandon the ship by jumping off the ship because there just there wasn't the option. They weren't going to make it. But 
between 60 to 70 of the American sailors did apparently abandon the ship and tried to take the remaining boats to shore. Um, some decided to swim and drowned, uh, but most of those were collected by British boats, which went to pick them up at this point. Um, 40 managed to get to land, and they mostly found that the local Chilean authorities were not that keen on them. But they wouldn't do much actively against them, they just weren't that keen on them. At 18.20 hours, Porter struck his colours. Unfortunately, due to the fact he'd stuck so many flags up in Essex's rigging, and due to the fact that it was absolute chaos at this point because of the fire of Phoebe, it took 10 minutes for the Phoebe's crew to realise the Essex had struck its colours. 10 minutes. Because there are so many flags up there. There is so much stuff up there. They just don't realise. Tell me the thing, eh? Oh, he struck his colours. Oh. They stopped fighting. He hasn't actually been firing for properly for ages, so... He's now striking his colours. We've just been shooting at him. He's not been doing anything. Okay. It was also at this point that someone started to realise, hang on. There's the Essex Junior. Oh, it's there! It's, oh, that's where you are. <laughs> um, yeah, she, 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 at this point they notice her. But, um... Hillier... Boat comes across... And Porter actually is weeping while he's giving his sword to Hillier. Um, don't worry... Before anyone starts to think this is a real example of emotional growth and that Porter has recovered himself and has, you know, achieved a new level of humanhood. Um, no, no, he hadn't. By the next morning, he is um, debating the specifics of the battle and trying to argue that the British have been dishonourable in fighting the battle where it was and they've been dishonourable in standing off and not engaging. And um, Hillier is very, very glad to stick him on a ship far away from him. Because he's finding him annoying. It's a classic scenario, that one. In total, Phoebe suffered four killed, seven wounded. Uh, Cherub had one killed and three wounded. Essex had 58 dead and 65 wounded. Phoebe had holes below the waterline. Um, this is HMS Saturn. She comes into this uh, this conversation a bit in a bit in a harase form rather than her third gun uh, third rate form um, her rigging was cut in for, as well Essex had been hit with more than 200 shot mostly 18 pounder her stern was smashed in there was a hole in her counter her wheel and rudder were damaged all three masts were damaged. The figurehead had been shot away. 15 guns were disabled. 55 of the gun crew had been killed. So 55 of the 58 dead were gun crew. Um, 60 of the 65 wounded were gun crew. This might explain why the guns are not working that well. Are not working or not working at all the end. And the upper works and the rigging have been severely damaged. Now... Porter goes full... How do I put this politely? Porter goes full I am Braveheart scenario, i.e. Uh, I, I'm talking about the movie version of Braveheart rather than the real William Wallace, who's a far more interesting character than the movie version. Especially when you consider how they adjusted the ages of certain princesses, because... If they'd really done that historically, I don't think William Wallace would have been, actually survived and would, would have managed to escape being cancelled by now. We'll leave that to one side. He uh, Porter declares the loss of the Essex was due to misfortune. Uh, Paul Hammond's sh uh, selection of carronade, uh, short-range carronade armament and the British violating neutrality, conducting themselves dishonorably and inhumanely, and plundering his personal property after engagement. 
Um, the problem is that most of his personal property was stored in the stern of the ship, which had been smashed to, blizz to blazes by the British 18-pounders. So, yeah. Um, the British hadn't violated neutrality. They really hadn't. Uh, in fact, Hillier had been invited to and hadn't done so. Um, Porter basically should never have gone to Valapriso in January. He certainly shouldn't have been waiting there all the way into the in, in, into the end of into February. Uh, there is no reason to wait a month for the British to turn up. You turn up in Valapriso, you go there, you then head back to the United States. He, he felt that the United States had the right to reclaim the Essex from the British because of this honour. The, the British just went, you must be kidding us. You must be kidding us. I think... I'm not sure if the governor of Valaparaiso ever heard this account, because if he had, I, I can imagine that man would have been foaming at the mouth. I can all the sheer stress and some of the accounts which come out about that poor governor and the stuff he's put up with. Um, in, and I do love this. It, it's, it's one of the really sort of big differences, and I'm going to use the classic historian phrase now, so brace yourself. In contrast... Classic historian. Feel the shivers. In contrast, Hillier praises Porter. Says he does good conduct. Claimed he only surrendered when all his other options were expended. And, found, and reported that he found on Essex provisions for a six-month cruise. He b brought all the sh uh, ships into Valaprizo, transferred the prisoners to a Spanish prison hulk. And then starts repairing the shot holes below Phoebe's waterline, as well as repairing the Essex as well. And that start, it starts on the 2nd of April. As mentioned earlier, on the 13th of April, Neris and Targus arrive. Now, this video has been going on for over two hours, so I'm not going to go into all the details which come next. But I am going to go into a discussion of whether or not Porter's grand cruise was worth it. Because there's a lot of stuff which comes after, including Porter's own escape. Or rather, he's on a... Remember this from earlier? Cartel ship. And when it's stopped by the British ships, which is the... Uh, Razaid HMS Saturn on her return to the United States. He escapes from what was the Essex Junior, which was being used as the cartel ship, by boat. Almost gets fired upon by American coastal batteries. Actually does get to extent fired upon, but doesn't get sunk by them. And manages to return to the United States gloriously for having escaped the British. When the whole reason he'd been sent up there on the Essex Junior, which was being used as a car dealership, was to be returned. But he escaped, so he didn't have to keep his parole. He could still serve. Yes, he'd escaped. The only one who was really annoyed about this was Cochrane, because he considered him a recruiting asset. Everyone else in the Royal Navy was going... And Porter, of course, declared himself a hero, and he specifically claims that he'd inflicted two and a half million dollars in damage and cost the British six million to counter his crews in terms of redeploying ships that could counter the United States uh, and himself. Um, the sad reality is that, as I've mentioned a couple of times already, the British had, as they were no longer fighting Napoleon, had freed up over a hundred frigates alone to go over to deal with the United States and the issues. Uh, they also had a whole host of third rates and a horde of smaller ships, i.e. post ships, brigs and sloops, backing up those frigates. It's really not a good scenario for the Americans. And these are the prizes and what happened to them. 
So the Atlantic, uh, that was recaptured on the 28th of March, and that was what had become the Atlantic, was what had become the Essex Junior. She sent us a cartel ship to New York with him aboard. And she arrives there, but the Marshall District sees her. They then condemn her and sell her for $25,000. So that's one ship. Okay, then there's the Catherine. Uh, the captors burnt her off Valapriso in February 1814. Um, she was burnt outside Valapriso, but that had also annoyed. But that was just before the British arrived. Um, the Greenwich was burnt in, at, in New Cahiva, and then the Hector was taken into Valapriso and burnt there on 14 February. So there are four ships which are lost to the British completely. Then we have the Orange, which is the Charlton, which is turned over to the crews and sailed back to England as a cartel. So the British get that one back. Thank you. Um, the Rose, which is given up to captured crews and sent to, to, for England, uh, given up to captured crews and sent for England, but had to put into Lima, Lecky, and arrives in England in March 1814. And the Town, which is recaptured by mutineers, who then sell her to Port Jackson, and then she's sent back to England, where owners reclaimed her payment, her on payment of salvage. Okay, that's the orange. What happens to the blue? Well, all oh, the Montezuma, the chilling go and seized her at Valapriso in spring 1814, where she laid up and sold, retaining the, uh, retaining the proceeds to pay for various things which had been cost to them. Always fun when that happens. Uh, let's see, and then the green. Well, uh, became, uh, Georgina became the USS Georgina, 28th April 1813. HMS Barossa recaptured Georgina and sent her into Bermuda. Uh, New Zealander became the HMS Belvedere, recaptured New Zealander on 28th... No, um, HMS New Belvedere recaptured New Zealand on 21st April 1814 as she was one day out of arriving in New York. This is the trouble when you've got a blockade at home. The ships aren't getting there. Policy was, well, she had a run in with HMS Ramleys and HMS Loire, and they recaptured her and sent her into Halifax, Nova Scotia. And then Sir Andrew Hammond uh, was captured, recaptured by Cherub on the 12th of June, 1814. So Cherub has real fun, because she technically gets the credence for taking the Essex Junior as well. The thing is... Yeah... That's affected a few ships. That certainly has affected a few ships. But that's not that much in cost. The thing is, he could have probably caused two and a half million in damage if he'd gone after one silver ship. He'd probably cost more. But his ship couldn't really take on a silver ship because it's armed like Phoebe is. And its crew know what they're fighting for. A whole lot of silver, which is next to them. They're not going to give that up without a fight. So, yeah. And as for countering him, to be honest, it's a frigate. If they'd have to send a third rate, that's a bigger commitment. If they'd have to send something, a rase, etc. But realistically, it's frigates. And it's the standard British frigates going there. And they would normally have frigates in that station anyway. Um, protecting British merchants and interests and... Doing what Hillier then goes on to, and Hillier goes on to call, to get a peace agreement and various details between Chile and Peru and various things sorted out. Um, Porter declares himself a hero and all sorts of things, and uh, claim and tends to put his crews as being the most successful of any American frigate captain of the war. I would argue that other captains were more successful and it caused a lot more trouble for the British. Certainly in volume of vessels taken, Porter is at the front, but I would argue others were better. And... Yeah, he, he, he had caused all sorts of issues. He really did. 
but mostly he caused those issues for himself. So in summary, when I did the live, I titled it something like the The Loudly Bold Against a Quiet Professional, I think was one of the options I considered. Porter was all that. Porter has swagger, Porter has oomph, Porter has all the abilities of Porter's imagination, which is not much. He finds himself against a quiet professional who honestly should have stayed quiet and not got in the word game. He really shouldn't. And does his best. But he can't compete in that scenario. He's looking for glory, and he really needs commanders who are also equally searching for glory. Someone else who's going to want to engage in a close range duel and a boarding action. At no point is Hillier going, oh, I want to fight a boarding action. He's done that. He doesn't need to do another. He's done enough. There is no point there is no point in the glory of boarding their ship. Close getting in close range with the Essex is a good way to lose your ship. Hillier's not stupid. And that's your real problem. And that's also the problem you have with any ship. These to, uh, today or in any point period. If you argue at armor ship, so it is extremely capable in a single scenario or a single framework of scenarios, you can be massively successful as long as your opponent is prepared to play the same game as you and are prepared to let you set the scenario. The moment they're not, the moment they will fight back the moment they will resist your scenario and defend against it. You're shot. You're no more. You have no chance. And that is the reality. That is the reality of it. Now, I always end these videos with a question, and realistically, the question is this. Let's say he doesn't have command of the Essex. Let's say Porter has something like the Constitution, like Ironsides. A proper American heavy frigate. Big frigate. 24 pounder frigate. What do you think the British would have done? Now, I've already said myself, I think if there had been a 24-pounder frigate there, I think there would at least have been a Razé in the squadron which arrived with with Hillier. If not, it would have been Dixon with 72. But what do you think the British would have done? Because if you turn up with a 72, then... It, well, does Porter come out and try and fight a seventy? Uh, try and fight a seventy-four? Sorry, I said seventy-two earlier, didn't I? Seventy-four. Do, do, would he? Do you think he'd do that? Would he go for that glory? There have been several who have been critical of Porter and his decision not to strike earlier, his decision to sacrifice his crew and try and keep fighting when the situation was ho hopeless. But there's an honest question in my mind whether it was really ten minutes that he was trying to surrender for, or whether it was longer. Ten minutes sounds bad enough, but honestly, there were so many flags up there, and he had so many different things flying, that the British might have not noticed it for ages. you got smoke billing around, you've got all sorts of flags down there. Has he? Has he struck his colours? Has he struck his colours? Or has it just been shot down? Were those his colours, or were the, 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 what about the other flags? Are they his colours? What's going on? You don't, you don't know. So that's the question. 
Well, it's a two-part question. One, what do you think happens if Porter has something like the Constitution now, has the equivalent frigate to the Constitution there? What do you think the British have sent, and how do you think things go? And two, the more interesting one to me is if Bainbridge is there and in charge. But I don't think Bainbridge would have done I, I cannot imagine any scenario where William Bainbridge is sitting in that harbour with Constitution and Essex and is going, I'm going to wait here for the British to turn up. I don't see Bainbridge doing that. Bainbridge is not that kind of... Yes, he's he likes glory. Yes, he likes winning battles. He's not going to sit in a harbour for a month going, come and get me. Basically, Porter's pulling the thing of, come on if you think you're hard enough. And the trouble is, he's not hard enough to be able to do that. If you're going to do that, you need to be a tough fighter. And Porter's ship, for all its glory, for all its capabilities, is not up to that task. It isn't. But I'd be interested to see what you say. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much for watching. If you like the video, please like, maybe share, and subscribe. That would all be very nice. And if you want to support the channel and my book addiction, then please, patron, co uh, ko fi membership, they're all wonderfully appreciated. And thank you for the super chats and super thanks and all those other things. It's all really appreciated because history books are expensive and I'm addicted. On a serious note, it's... It allows me to do interesting videos on this channel. Even while I'm in the middle of moving house and all sorts of things, it allows me to keep everything going, your support, so thank you. Thank you very much, and take care. And what we have coming up, we have coming up next week, the conception, operation, collusion of the Atlantic Conveyor and other rapid conversions. I hope you'll enjoy it. It's going to be a, a few little sh interesting ships. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and take care.